A hurricane in America, a super typhoon in the Philippines. The signs of climate change are everywhere. Wildfires last longer, are bigger and more intense. Rising oceans, lengthy droughts, extremes are increasingly common. What can be done? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Hashim Ahal Barra. Much of the world's attention this week has been on two powerful storms, Hurricane Florence in the United States and Super Typhoon Mankert in the Philippines. What were once rare forces of nature are becoming almost regular events. It's further evidence of climate change and that our ability to do something about it is narrowing. We begin with this report from California, where a major conference on climate change is currently underway. It's a state that has seen more than its share of extremes. Here's Rob Reynolds. More intense fires, more devastating droughts, deadly heat waves with tens of thousands of premature deaths, a rising ocean and disastrous floods. That's the future California faces due to man-made global warming over the next century, according to a major new state climate change assessment. University of California scientist Stephanie Pencel helped review the findings. The future seems dire if we don't do anything. The assessment says heat waves and polluted air could cause up to 11,000 deaths annually by mid-century. The pain of climate change will be felt most acutely by vulnerable, poor, and marginalized people. The poor are gonna be hit by the apocalyptic future like the poor are always hit by any apocalypse. Harder and worse. Aging infrastructure like this major dam that nearly failed last year will be heavily stressed by heavier rains and flooding associated with the changing climate. California is already dealing with the biggest, most deadly outbreak of wildfires in state history. But the assessment says the area burned by such conflagrations will increase 77 percent by the turn of the century. And two-thirds of California's famous beaches could completely disappear by then, devoured by the Pacific rising nearly three meters above its current level. In response to these dire warnings about climate change, California's legislature and its governor have instituted a new law that would phase out the use of all fossil fuels to generate the state's electricity. The law requires California to rely on renewable sources like solar and wind power for 60% of its energy by 2030 and for using only carbon-free sources, including nuclear power, by 2045. It's not going to be easy, and it will not be immediate, but it must be done. California is committed to doing whatever is necessary to meet the existential threat of climate change. But with President Donald Trump's repudiation of the Paris Climate Accord and his efforts to increase coal mining and relax standards for fuel-efficient vehicles, California is taking the lead, hoping other states and cities will help it stave off a fiery and foreboding future. Rob Reynolds, Al Jazeera, Los Angeles. 2018 has seen extreme weather patterns across the globe. Scientists are trying to find explanations for these new phenomena. Europe has just come through a summer of record heat that saw wildfires break out above the Arctic Circle. Most of the fires were in Sweden, which experienced its worst drought in 74 years. Firefighters in California battled more than 6,000 wildfires that burned 1 million acres of land. Experts say the U.S. wildfire season is now 87 days longer than it was 30 years ago. And record rainfall in Japan triggered landslides that smashed homes and forced evacuations in July. That was followed by two weeks of severe heat. More than 300 people in Japan died to, due to extreme weather-related incidences. Let's bring in our panel from Asheville, North Carolina, in the path of the hurricane Florence, Andrew Jones, 
the co-founder and director of Climate Interactive. From Boulder, Colorado, Kevin Tremberth, senior scientist at the National Center for Atmospheric Research. And from Potsdam in Germany, Stefan Ramstorff, chairman of the Earth Impact Analysis Research Domain at the Potsdam Institute for Climate Impact Research. Welcome to you all. Andrew, are we talking here about a normal storm season or there's more to it? Oh, it is just an enormous season here in, in North Carolina. And it's fascinating how we created some of this ourselves. Um, the scientists like Professor Dromsdorf had been predicting sea level rise on the North Carolina coast for a long time. But local politicians passed a law in 2012 saying that they could not include those forecasts in real estate development. Mm -hmm. More houses were built, and now those houses are being hit by Hurricane Florence. And I'm getting texts because we open up, I opened up a couple rooms in my house, and people are coming and fleeing the storm here to the mountains of North Carolina, where I am, further inland. It's mm -hmm. quite a year that we created somewhat. Kevin, now we have Florence battering uh, Carolinas. You have the Mancut in the Philippines, unprecedented uh, waves of uh, uh, heat in the European uh, uh, continent. Are we, have we entered the age of extreme weathers now? Certainly the climate change factor, the extra global warming, the extra heat that exists uh, from the climate change is exacerbating all of these events. So there's a tremendous amount of natural variability where these events occur from one year to the next is largely natural, but when they occur, they're more extreme than they used to be. Now this, this ranges from the, the droughts and the wildfires mm -hmm. to these very strong storms. Stefan, there's this interesting study uh, by climate modeler Kevin Reed of the Stony Brook University in New York, who said that the Florence was bigger than it would be had it occurred in a, in a world where there was no human-caused warming. Uh, is this the case? Is this an indication that this is because it's a human-induced phenomenon? Well, this is uh, what is called an attribution study and that compares predictions of how the storm develops in the world as it is today with elevated greenhouse gas levels and in a second run a prediction without the elevated greenhouse gas levels in order to isolate the effect of climate change and indeed this study found uh, that the storm was uh, likely bigger than it would have been without global warming and that actually conforms to a an, an trend towards uh, bigger storms. Mm -hmm. Andrew, I mean Let's start with the uh, Hurricane Florence, which is, seems to be unique in a way or another because of its slowing pace. It will be hovering above Carolinas for almost 36 hours. Is this something rare? And what impact will it have on the areas affected in general? Yeah, much like what we just heard um, about that Stony Brook study, the forecast was for 50% more rainfall due to the effect of climate change. So yes, we are seeing a slower storm. It seems like it's much more like Hurricane Harvey, which a year ago dumped so much rain for so many days on Houston. So what we're seeing here, even in the mountains, is more people who are just getting rained out and flooded out. Um, and in, this is no surprise. We've had the, um, since 1980, we've had a doubling of the frequency of flooding events. And now we're actually seeing that here in North Carolina um, firsthand. Mr. Trumbeth, we've been talking over the last few months on this particular show about the climate change, the changing patterns uh, worldwide. Maybe just to try to further understand this phenomena. Can we say at this particular moment that we have gone through the tipping point and that the pattern now is absolutely, definitely irreversible? Oh, well, climate change is clearly with us. I think it's uh, greatly underestimated by many, uh, many people, by a number of politicians in particular. I think it's also underestimated in terms of its current impact in terms of the economy uh, by the, uh, the, uh, by the uh, 
the people who deal with all of the finances and so on. It, you know, the cost of the storms last year was something like $300 billion. You know, the, the general estimate, I think, is that uh, in the U.S., uh, the cost of climate change is certainly tens of billions of dollars every year. And, uh, and so it, it behooves us to do something about it. Mm -hmm. uh, it. It's actually economic to do that. Mr. Armstrong, I mean, we are in the domain of science, but still I feel like the lines here are blurred. This is one of the most politicized issues. People say it's not true. The others say, no, this is just advanced by the leftists to try to uh, perpetuate their own agenda. What do you think should be done now by the scientist community and by the policymakers worldwide to try to at least slow down the uh, climate change? Well, it's, it is an unfortunate truth that there are a lot of people that don't want to face a harsh reality and they rather deny it or close their eyes to it. That won't solve the problem, though. We have known about this problem for more than half a century. In 1965, there was the first official government uh, report to the then uh, United States President Lyndon B. Johnson about the impending global warming due to rising greenhouse gases. And that basically already predicted all the things that are happening, like uh, melting ice sheets and sea level rise. And because we have lost so much time debating and debating whether this is an urgent problem or not, it has just simply become more and more urgent. And now we're in the middle of a crisis and we have to really hit the brakes mm -hmm. on global emissions very hard if we want to stop global warming, as was agreed in Paris, in the Paris Agreement in 2015. We'll talk later about the Paris Agreement. Mr. Jones, the IPCC, which is the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, predicts an in incredible rise in uh, global temperature over the next uh, century, which begs the question, what should be the next step to be taken by the international community, since this is a pattern that we have to deal with? Yeah, well said. And I, I, I'd like to use this to address, Mr. Hashim, what, what you said about have we had passed a tipping point. The answer is no. We still are in this mode where we both need to manage the unavoidable. Mm -hmm. We're seeing hurricanes. We need to manage what is here, manage the unavoidable. But we also can avoid so much that is unmanageable well into the future. And that's what is the international bodies need to do. We need to stop burning coal, oil, and gas peak investment in infrastructure in coal, oil, and gas by 2020, invest in energy efficiency, less methane, less HFCs and F gases, uh, more electrification of vehicles. Uh, all these things across the board can be done. And frankly, the whole UNFCCC process pulled together at the Paris Agreement is set up to do that. We just need to do much more of it, much more aggressively so that we don't create future mm -hmm. Hurricane Florence's. Kevin, but if there is still wiggle room to do something to fix the situation, but then again, when you look at the vital signs of the planet, the carbon emission, global temperature, the Arctic ice minimum, and the ice sheets and the sea level, they're not good at all. They're indicative of a cataclysmic transformation yet to happen. So how can we handle this situation in particular? Well, in addition to the the need to address the underlying cause of the problem, that is to say, cut down on the emissions of carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases uh, and the, the, their effects on the climate, we have to recognize that climate change is already with us. And this means we have to adapt to the plan for the climate change that's already with us. This means uh, building resiliency of, of various kinds. Uh, preparing for the consequences of what we're already going to have to deal with. And, and this is one of the things which is very apparent. It's not happening anything like enough. It was strongly evident last year, for instance, in Houston, mm -hmm. that the threat uh, for hurricanes in, in Houston, throughout the, the Caribbean and uh, in Florida and uh, in Puerto Rico has been very clear for a number of years. And it was appalling to me the lack of preparation, the lack of uh, adaption and resiliency with regard to things like electrical systems and flooding and so on, 
We're seeing that again in North Carolina here. And yet, you know, two years ago, uh, Hurricane Matthew went through the same area and they had more than 10 inches of rain over extensive areas and there was flooding. And still they have not got the capability of dealing with this in a, in a reasonable fashion. Mm -hmm. Stefan, don't you think that the science, scientist community itself should reinvent itself in a way or another to try to convince people? I'll give you an example. You've been saying for quite some time that the fuel, fossil fuel industry may need to, should change. But do you think that they are ready to sort of ditch that industry for the sake of a cleaner planet? Aren't we here trying to find out a different approach to try to convince people that it's about time to change? Well, I don't think it can be blamed on the scientific community because the scientific community has really done its job informing the people, informing the policy makers. We have this intergovernmental panel on climate change that issues regular reports. And yes, they could be more readable and accessible. But basically, the facts have been clear for a very long time. And scientists have very clearly communicated those. And so, I think it is very clear if we want to fulfill the Paris Agreement and stay below, well below two degrees, then we have to reach zero global emissions around the middle of the century and time is really running out. And mm -hmm. I would say it's not just the international organizations, it's now the national governments. Every single national government has to look how it's going to reach the, it's part of the goal of the Paris Agreement, and that includes my government in Germany. We are not on track either. Mm -hmm. uh, speaking of uh, raising awareness, uh, go, go, ahead. Go, go ahead, Mr. Andrew. About scientific methods. Uh, my colleague at MIT, Professor John Sturman, says, research shows that showing people research doesn't work. Mm -hmm. It sounds a little funny. Research shows that showing people research doesn't work. So what we're experimenting with and what we think is necessary and what does work is giving people e experiences such as games, such as interactive simulation experiences. We've developed them on adaptation, but also one called World Climate, played by 50,000 people around the world, where they actually live the Paris Agreement. And we find that 81% of people who go through the game, even those who are against free market regulation, mm -hmm. are more committed to action. So we as scientists need to find different ways to get, engage people on their own terms, bringing in emotion and heart mm -hmm. and not just we can do this if we change our I methods. See, I see your point. Kevin, don't you find it baffling that in a desolate area in the desert in Africa, people believe in climate change? When you go to places like the United States of America, which is one of the most advanced societies in the world, despite the body uh, data, despite the most sophisticated satellite imagery that you get from NASA and other circles, authorities still are in denial about climate change. This relates, of course, to vested interests very much so. And there is uh, huge amounts of uh, funding, uh, millions of dollars from the fossil fuel industry in particular, designed to distort the pictures and, and undermine the messages from scientists that this is a real problem and we need to plan for it and we need to deal with what we've already got. And, uh, and there are some people at very high levels in the government in the United States who just don't uh, have any regard for facts whatsoever. I mean, it's really, it's really disconcerting. And, you know, it's, it's hard to make progress when those kinds of people have power. Mm -hmm. Stefan, it has been widely s said that the Paris Agreement could be the best way out to stop the clock from ticking down towards doomsday. Let's talk a little bit about some of the guidelines of the Paris Agreement. First, reducing the carbon emissions as soon as possible. Do you think that that's possible when you don't have any binding, uh, legally binding resolution that puts more pressure on countries to follow suit? Well, it, it is a binding agreement. It's just uh, that there are no sanctions if you don't actually uh, fulfill your obligations. Mm -hmm. But it is actually very difficult because we don't have a world government. We still are at the stage where the world is composed of a large number of nation states, almost 200 of them. And if you try to install a top-down 
agreement where there are sanctions and governments are forced to certain emissions reductions, then we simply would not get an agreement because there are always some, especially countries that see themselves as superpowers mm -hmm. that are not going to submit to uh, uh, any sanctions presented by the international community or mm -hmm. some kind of international body. Mm -hmm. And so I think, unfortunately, maybe, but it's the only way that it can work is the way the Paris Agreement works in that there are these voluntary commitments mm -hmm. by all the individual nations mm -hmm. and then there has to be just some kind of political pressure, peer okay. pressure for on all the countries to actually honour their commitments. Speaking about that p political pressure in particular, uh, Andrew, how is it possible to maintain uh, global warming below two degrees Celsius in practical terms? Yeah, in very practical terms, Oh, and by the way, the Paris Agreement, we done the calculations, instead of heading to 4.2, we're headed about 3.3 degrees if all countries follow those actions. So what we see is that we need to take actions that will take us from 3.3 down to 2. And just yesterday, several days ago, I was in um, San Francisco. Mm -hmm. Governor Terry Brown has pulled together the Global Climate Action Summit with sub-national actions. So he has all around the world, uh, people who are you know, mayors and heads of states and cities and corporations. I actually had to leave early because of Hurricane Florence. It was, mm -hmm. uh, a lot of people did as well. What needs to happen is actions at those levels. And what we're finding at those levels is that we're, cities and corporations are saving money with clean energy and energy efficiency. Communities are doing what we call multi-solving, capturing the benefits, say, of cleaner air, Less coal helps the climate, but less coal really helps respiratory disease, mm -hmm. asthma, or kids in school productivity. We get to take advantage of the short-term benefits mm -hmm. and do all the things that are needed at that subnational actions. Mm -hmm. And okay. what that would lead to, of course, peaking coal, oil, gas before 2025, mm -hmm. reducing on the order of six to eight percent a year to what several people have mentioned uh, mm -hmm. near about net zero by 2050. Okay, Kevin. But at the same time, when the most influential nation on earth, the United States of America, pulls out from the Paris Agreement, it really sends a bad message for you, the science community, and for everyone who is willing, despite all the challenges he faces, to try to shift towards clean energy. Yes, so the, I think there could be a major transformation if there is a real price put on carbon. And, and so we need to decarbonize the economy and but a lot of this, these incentives have to occur probably at the governmental level and uh, adhere to across all of the nations. And once this occurs, and that could occur quite rapidly, then the private sector will very quickly get on board. It has to be implemented in the right way, in a gradual fashion, but, uh, but this is not going to happen with the, with the current government. The, uh, in the United States. The, the second thing, as a part of the uh, Paris Agreement, is the presence of this Green Fund in which the, the developed countries are supposed to contribute uh, mm -hmm. funds in order to enable uh, other countries to build resilience and I to see adapt point. to climate change and to okay. not make the same mistakes of the developed countries by going down the route of uh, fossil I fuel see. for, for developing I see. electricity. Uh, this is going to be my need electricity, mm -hmm. but you know, renewable electricity is, is becoming increasingly available. This is going to be my last question. Stefan, do you think it's about time for us to try to think about alternatives instead of quick fixes, like moving populations towards inland, rebuilding the infrastructure? Because when you read the literature, it seems that we are into what looks like a new era. Well, I think we already know much of the solutions, we just have to implement them so we don't uh, have to think about new solutions, although obviously it helps to improve them, but we know we can go 100% renewable energy in the next decades if only we want to, if there's a political will to do that. And I think that is still the main thing that is lacking. And of course, in terms of adaptation, I think people will either move away from some vulnerable coastal areas mm -hmm. or they will be forced out in some flooding disaster. And on, on that particular positive note, our programme comes to an end. Andrew Jones, Kevin Tremberth, Stefan Ramstoff. 
Thank you very much indeed. I'm looking forward to seeing you in the near future to continue our conversation about climate change. And thank you too for watching. You can see the program again anytime by visiting our website, aljazeera.com. For further discussion, go to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. You can also join the conversation on Twitter. Our handle is at AJ Inside Story. From me, Hashem Ahlbara, and the whole team here. Bye for now.